in the very first week of this class, we did the icebreaker that asked you about your first sort of economic memory. And many of you answered with the 2008 crash, with the great financial crisis. Do we remember what happened back then? Well, it all started in the sort of with a bubble in the American housing market, right? In the American real estate market. Huh? People who should have never even gotten a mortgage suddenly could afford Mac mansions. Hmm? And this was fueled sort of by a repackaging of these risky mortgages into financial instruments called mortgage backed securities. And maybe some of you have already seen the movie Big Short uh, a few years ago. If you haven't, this is a very much uh, sort of a recommended watching, okay? But essentially, banks bought these sort of risky repackaged mortgage uh, bundles, huh? and which then fueled more demand for these and more risk taking and more exposure of uh, um, you know to to this risk on all sorts of banks and other financial institutions balance sheets. This was a hugely profitable scheme, but there was way too much risk in the system, and of course, as we all know it didn't turn out very well and it ended sort of in an epic market failure. What happened when the whole house of cards came crashing down? Well, we all learned about systemic risk, right? About uh, what happened when, when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, for example. The, basically, the fear was that there would be other banks, that it would sort of trigger a cascade of, uh, of, of banks going to the brink of bankruptcy hmm, because of all these toxic assets on their, on their balance sheets. And of course, once one bank goes bankrupt, other banks are impacted by this directly. So we, we, the fear was this whole sort of systemic failure, huh? um, crash that would take down the entire sort of financial system, loans, mortgages, um, runs on banks. And basically governments and central banks had no choice but to step in and bail out uh, or take over banks in order sort of to keep them in float in, in order to avoid the collapse of the entire system. And what was the slogan that sort of emerged from this uh, from this chaos and these sort of frantic rescue oper rescue operations? Well, the idea of too big to fail. There are some players in the financial system that are so large and so well connected, interconnected with other financial institutions, etc., and um, that they cannot be allowed to fail. But being too big to fail, of course, creates a new sort of problem. Um, and that's what we call moral hazard. Um, it comes from sort of its terminology from insurance industry. Hmm? And basically it's about recklessness. If bad behavior, recklessness, um, excessive risk taking doesn't get punished, then there's no incentive to stop doing it. If large banks can make more money by taking excessive risks, um, in, safe in the knowledge that when things go bad, uh, the taxpayer will step in and bail them out. Then we really live in a gangster's paradise. This egregious example of moral hazard is a type of uh, is, an, is a type of principal agent problem, of course, with the other type of uh, principal agent problems being adverse selection. And these twin problems of moral hazard and adverse selection that characterize principal agent problems um, are at the heart of the type of market failure that is caused by asymmetric information. And that is the topic of today's lecture. Let's clarify some of these terms relating to principal agent models and see another example of moral hazard in action. In general, principal agent models consist of a principal uh, who wants someone to perform a task for them. Hmm. Let's say um, our principal in this next example is the British government. And the British government as the principal um, wants someone to perform a task. And for example, set up a functioning test and trace system for the coronavirus. How do, get, how do they get that? Well, they have basically a couple of choices. Hmm? They can, of course, try to do that themselves. Hmm? But the central government itself, as you know, number 10 office, cannot do it. OK, so they would have to set up a separate sort of bureaucracy or use an existing bureaucracy like the Public Health England or local health uh, public health teams or set up or use an outside 
uh, service providers. So they have some options in who actually performs this task. But the central government itself, of course, cannot just do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's at the core of the principal agent problems. Uh, many, uh, a lot of the literature on principal agent problems actually focuses on bureaucracy. So this is not something that is special to outsourced sort of service provision, but applies in similar ways to um, to bureaucrats executing tasks for political principles. More generally, why do agents, uh, why do principals uh, delegate tasks to agents? Well, it's a variety of reasons, but they usually revolve around uh, lacking information for sort of for the task at hand, uh, lacking the expertise or the know-how for the task at hand. Sometimes they're cost considerations, so setting up a whole new bureaucracy sounds quite costly compared to uh, say, giving it to an existing service provider. Um, and there's sometimes also more nefarious reasons, such as sort of avoiding blame for, for failure and, and sort of unloading that blame on some outsourced service provider. But in general, let's assume the principal wants to delegate um, this task to some agents, you know, to perform this task uh, as well as possible. So the government delegates this task. To whom? Well, to an agent. What's an agent? Well, in this example, it's the outsourced service provider. But we can think of bureaucrats as agents as well. Obviously, the agent doesn't do this for free. Uh, the agent gets paid some money to perform this task. Now, in the next stage of the game, because it is a game of sorts, isn't it? Um, the agent has a choice. The agent can perform the task or has to perform the task, of course. Um, but basically, there is a choice whether to expand a lot of effort, to incur a lot of costs, set up a very expensive system um, that performs well, uh, set up a high quality test and trace system. Huh? But that requires hiring qualified staff and sort of in general spending a lot of money. Um, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative, for example, is to spend less money, hire less qualified staff, exert less effort um, and sort of set up a crappy version of the test and trace system. What's more profitable from the perspective of the agent? Well, obviously to spend less money and you know, incur less costs and hire less you know, expensive staff and sort of to only perform the task just about complying with the, with the contract or whatever that has been set up and sort of provide a crappy test and trace system. Um, obviously, if the government was able to directly observe this, um, there wouldn't be a problem. But the government had to delegate the task specifically because of this lack of information and the, the, you know, the ability to perform this task themselves. So, of course, they cannot actually observe the effort that the agent exerts. So this is the, the core of the problem. Huh? This is the information asymmetry. The agent knows how much they have spent and you know, what kind of quality or non-quality people they have hired, what kind of system they have set up. But the government cannot directly observe all of this. Huh? This is the hidden action, huh? the effort or spend in this case by the, by the agent is, is the hidden action here. Mm -hmm. And this information asymmetry means that the principal cannot be sure whether, for example, observing the crappy outcome um, is due to sort of low effort, you know, profit seeking behavior by the agent or whether it's just sort of due to chance and 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 the difficulty of this task uh, that they have uh, that they have set uh, this is the core of the problem so a principal delegates a task to an agent and that agent engages in some unobservable action that then determines the outcome for both the principal and the agent. And the core of all principal agent models is basically thinking about how does the principal get to get the agent to do uh, what they want them to do, to act in the way that they want them to act. And from the perspective of the agent, of course, um, how do they sort of maximize profit or utility um, in this scenario? We have just learned about principal agent models and about the conflict of interest between the principal and the agent uh, in these models. So these models always include a principal who delegates a task to an agent who then performs this task, but their actual sort of activity, efforts, uh, uh, etc., are unobservable to the principal um, and they determine the, the outcome. And the core is always how does the principal get the agent to do what they, what they want? 
uh, and not behave in a way that is perhaps in the in best interest of the agent, but not in the best interest of the principal. So let's look at a few more examples of this. The first row is our example from just before. The government uh, is the principal, the agent in this case is the bureaucrat or outsourced service provider, and the hidden action is the sort of the costly effort, the quality of service that is being that is being provided. Another example is from the beginning of the lecture, of course. You know, we as taxpayers, in a way, act as principals vis-a-vis -vis the banks and other financial institutions in terms of risk taking, because we don't want them to take so much risk that we have to bail them out again. But sort of a cursory look at the current situation in financial markets makes you wonder whether we're sort of drifting into such a situation again. The next example is a classic example, uh, rental car insurance. Huh? Um, so in this case, the insurance is perhaps in a way the principal who wants us as sort of rental, rental car users, of course, to avoid sort of unnecessary risk taking and sort of take care of, of, the, of the car. But of course, as sort of the person sort of renting the car, we don't really care about the long term uh, you know, outcomes for this specific uh, specific car and maybe don't treat it as if it was our own car. The next sort of standard example of moral hazard, of course, is uh, the employee relationships, uh, employer relationships. So the relationship between the employer who acts as a principal who delegates tasks to their employees and wants them to work hard uh, uh, to, to exert a lot of effort to to really focus on on work all day in the office. Um, but of course, the employee can instead sort of, I don't know, goof off on Facebook or TikTok all day and not spend a lot of effort. Another example is similar to this in a way is the shareholders. They want the CEO of the company to you know, perform well and to, to implement good strategy. That is a long term strategy that benefits their uh, you know, their shares, their, their ownership of the company uh, long term, rather than sort of engage in sort of short term behavior that gives the CEO big bonuses, but sort of endangers the long term uh, um, stability or success of the company. The next one is quite familiar to us. Uh, the lecturer or professor wants the students to learn the material, of course. Eh? So I, as the principal, want you guys as the agents in a, warm to, in a way to perform this task, to learn all the material, cover all the material, you know, understand the things, the topics well. Uh, but of course, I cannot, I cannot observe the learning directly. But we can talk in the seminars and we can do formative assessment or summative assessments such as exams to test whether you're really learning the material. The final example is, of course, more interesting for us as sort of political science people, as you know, voters want politicians to, you know, implement certain types of policies huh, and not, uh, you know, sell out after the election, or they want them to be, you know, not corrupt. Uh, to 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 be proper and and uh, you know honest rather than accept bribes from from uh, all sorts of uh, other people. What I want you to do now is I want you to pause the video and think about your own example. Okay, uh, think about a principal agent problem where there's moral hazard, huh? where there's a principal who delegates a task to an agent uh, who performs this task, but there's hidden uh, hidden action huh? that determines the outcome. Hmm? Um, so think about your own example, be original, and post your example um, on Moodle and vote up the uh, good examples from your classmates, please. We hopefully now understand the problem of moral hazard in the principal agent relationship. So what are the solutions? How does the principal get the agent to do what they want? Um, and this is the purview of what is what is sometimes called contract theory or mechanism design within economics. Um, and the big question is, how do you design contracts? Because a lot of this will be based on contracts, of course. Um, how do you design contracts um, or interactions that serve the principal well? Um, and the obvious sort of first thing is to have a contract and to sort of include something like performance measures, uh, specific descriptions of tasks that the agent needs to perform. What's the problem with that? Well, it's nicely summarized in this Dilbert cartoon. 
the boss says, your compensation will be based on achieving these goals. And the employee says, well, awesome. It's like written permission to ignore everything else you ask me to do. So specifying exactly what you want the agents to, uh, to, to do is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, in general, sort of, if we think about sort of um, principal agent problems more generally, we can think about mechanisms to align incentives. We want the agent to try to perform the goal in the same way that the principal wants the agent uh, to perform the goal. For example, if you want a lot of sales, you incentivize sales by giving people a sort of a share of, um, of the sales. Things like performance pay and bonuses uh, help in this regard. Um, you can also, on the negative side, include penalty clauses for not completing certain tasks. And that is something that every government should do with every outsourced contract, so that it is very clear what happens if certain tasks are not performed or not performed in a way that is acceptable or good enough, such as you know, failing to trace many contacts of people who had the coronavirus. In general, um, however, designing complete contracts that cover every eventuality is impossible because it is prohibitively costly to do that, unless you have a very simple, very specific task that you want the agent to perform. And then, in a way, um, contingent renewal act, uh, acts as an, as an opportunity to, to punish and to, to um, go beyond sort of the, the bits that are written into the contracts. Huh? So if you only renew con contracts with suppliers, for example, who have performed well according to the specific tasks, but also in general, um, you will maybe be able to sort of elicit uh, future compliance and to, to get what you, what you want. So for example, if a, an outside service provider had in the past been fined uh, by the serious fraud office for fraud, uh, by, for charging, for example, the Ministry of Justice uh, too much for electronic tax, one might not perhaps want to give this same service provider even bigger, even more life and death kind of important government contracts. So the exact design of the contract between the principal and the agent and the question of renewal of those contracts is really, really important. More generally, um, if we think about, about uh, moral hazard and principal agent problems, we can think about monitoring. Of course, the principal can spend money to try to observe or monitor to some extent what exactly the agent is doing. But the problem with this is, of course, that it is costly. Huh? So it's an additional cost on the principal. Um, in cases that are that that are perhaps not uh, this the specific case that we saw before, we can also think about things like reputation mechanisms. Hmm? All of us face this problem in a way. If we think about sort of where to eat uh, or or what kind of Airbnb to uh, to rent, huh? so reputation mechanisms help help enormously, of course, with those kinds of kinds of problems. If it is possible to see what other users have. Uh, have experienced what other buyers uh, or, or renters of the Airbnb or other diners in the in the case of the restaurant have experienced and whether they have liked it, that can perhaps inform our decision making. Um, so reputation mechanisms can be very helpful. And finally, if you think about situations that resemble principal agent problems, but they are the, that are not sort of formal contracted and there's no formal um, you know, punishment uh, mechanism uh, possible. But if you think, for example, about the question of the bailout, there has to be a credible commitment to actually punish misbehavior. But that's, of course, really, really difficult to achieve. As in the bailout example, um, for example, there is no real, not really any alternative. If the financial system again comes to the brink of collapse, of course, the government and central banks will again have to step in to, um, you know, to, 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 to stop this from happening. And so their sort of threat of punishment, their threat of, of, um, of not bailing out, for example, is not a credit. In sum, Getting, you know, making the agent do what you want as a principal is difficult. Um, but with good mechanism design, good contracts, good lawyers, um, you know, attention to detail, creation of sort of specific performance measures, um, you know, penalty inclusion of penalty clauses, question of sort of questions about contingent renewal um, and monitoring, it is of course possible to 
um, to succeed in this uh, in this way. But of course, the failure to include some of these things will also result in failure of the system as a whole and lead to sort of bad outcomes. We just learned about information asymmetry and moral hazard as a type of principal agent problem. In the next videos, we will encounter another type, another part of principal agent problems, and that is what we call adverse selection. And specifically, we will learn about the market for lemons. And we will then apply this market for lemons idea, this adverse selection idea, to the issue of health insurance and healthcare systems. And at the end, I'll say a couple more concluding words, because this will be, of course, the last uh, week of lecture videos for me after reading week my colleague Thomas Gift takes over.